So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. To today's uh, ICAT uh, webinar, the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency. Um, this is the first of a, a series of six webinars. I'll skip to the agenda. Um, so as you can see, the various different speakers, and I want to uh, continue on with the, the presentation. So um, we've really got a, a nice agenda and. To start off with, we do have David Antonioli uh, looking at the value of standardized approaches in addressing climate change. So I'll hand on over to David, who's online as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. And uh, it's great to have everybody here. And it's certainly very exciting to see that we're now at this stage of the development of ICAT. Um, it's just been you know, a long, a, a long process and a lot of hard work by a lot of people, but it's really great to see it kind of finally, you know, launch in a, in a formal way, uh, which we're doing here today. Um, you know, I just thinking back about the genesis of ICAT, you know, we thought, you know, back might have been even like six years ago that government action was going to be absolutely critical to meet all of the ambitious climate goals. But we realized at the time that there was no single set of tools um, that governments could use to credibly assess the impact of their policies. A lot of governments you know, were intending to assess the outcomes of their policies, and they often hired consultants here or there, but there was no overarching framework that provided some level of consistency across the board. So really the objective of ICAT was try to bring a lot of that knowledge into a single set of tools to enable governments to assess whether their climate in, whether the climate policies really reduce greenhouse gases. But another really key element of ICAT was recognizing that the sustainable development impact of policies was also going to be absolutely critical because, yeah, greenhouse gases are one thing, but it's really important and particularly for developing countries that they cared about well, what does this mean for, for me from economic and sustainable development perspective? So we really realized that, that it had to be, these, both of these had to be treated together in order to provide a compelling package. Um, and really in the end was not only would we, did we want to provide a toolbox to enable governments to assess their climate policies, but we wanted to provide a forum through which they could actually defend those climate policies. We know that um, you know, oftentimes climate policies get opposition because people believe that they'll be costly or they'll be unworkable, but we also know that policies will have tremendous economic side benefits. So we wanted to be able to provide a tool that put all that together and help governments you know, defend their climate policies. And in some cases, even you know, go out and find extra resources or financing to implement those policies. So that was the, the high level vision of where we wanted ICAT to go. And we wanted to leverage some initial work that was being done particularly by WRI. Um, and, you know, they recently were, were about to come out with the, uh, with the climate action, uh, with the policy assessment tool. And uh, we thought that it would, it would be beneficial to provide some more level detail for individual sectors. So that's why you'll see today and, and over the co coming series that there's detailed assessment guides for different policies. Um, and, of, and uh, you know, we then wanted to create the framework that would enable us to look at sustainable development in a wholesome in a wholesome way. And I think one of the real contributions coming out of ICAT is the the idea of transformational change. And I know I know the folks at, at DTU and, and Karen have spent a lot of time thinking about that, as well as the folks at WRI, how to create or how to define what transformational change, which ultimately is what we are all after. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, you'll you'll see this 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 set of uh, um, guides over and over, but it's a, it's really quite an impressive menu. I mean, what we have now is a toolbox that policymakers, consultants, NGOs, civil society can look to to try to assess the impacts of climate change policies. And again. To recap the point, there's there's several of these that look at individual sectors, looking at greenhouse gas emissions, um, and there's some of these that look at sustainable development, transformational change, and then non-state actors. So as you can see, this is starting to fill out a broader set of activities that are going to be done um, and that could be assessed. And an important one, which 
really hasn't gotten much traction, but I wanted to, fo to mention it now, is the technical review um, assessment guide, which if you think about um, what a certification body does, like Vera, one of the things that we require as part of our assessment and determination of whether someone meets the rules or not is, a, is an audit by an independent third party. So the technical review helps governments go down that path to begin to think about, well, I can you know, look at, use the guide for greenhouse gases or sustainable development, but if I want to have any third party validation of those outcomes, I might want to use the technical review guide to make sure or to, to demonstrate from an independent perspective that my policy has indeed had these impacts. So it's a very powerful tool. We haven't seen too much uptake of that yet, but I'm, I'm encouraged or hopeful that, that people will start to realize the real value of this because it will help demonstrate in an independent fashion the impact of all these policies and of course having used different guides. So together, I think this is a really powerful toolbox, but I don't think it's the end. Um, I, hopefully it will be more, more tools, perhaps more sectors, uh, maybe some revisions in the future, but certainly now this is a really powerful toolbox that people can use to credibly assess the impact of their policies. And so during this series, you'll be hearing from a number of practitioners who've gone deep and developed these guides, which will be really useful, but you'll also hear from practitioners like David Ross, who've taken this stuff and applied it in the field and had real outcomes assessed through the, through the use of the guides. And uh, I'm really encouraged, certainly by the group uh, at Sierra Gorda to have, to have used all six of the guides, which is really impressive. Um, and that, you know, you'll hear about that. But, but I think that the real lesson here is, you know, we're, in the, we're on the cusp of, of starting to look at a number of different climate policies and governments are starting to think about the Paris Agreement, how am I going to meet it, what sorts of policies are going to be used. And I think ICAT suite of assessment guides stands in a really powerful position and in a unique place to be able to contribute to that discussion and to provide the governments the tools they need to credibly assess their impact, the impact of their policies and move forward and really address the problem. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here and I look forward to hearing the webinar and I certainly hope you all enjoy the webinar series as well. Cheers. Thank you, David. Um, that really is uh, uh, key to uh, the assessment guides that they are combinable and uh, and that's the thing this webinar will get to uh, in terms of its application how to how to use it who are the intended users so uh, i will hand over the presentation uh, to mr henning wuster the director uh, of the initiative for climate action transparency thank you very much and good morning good afternoon uh, or good evening colleagues wherever you are uh, very happy to see so many of you uh, connected and I hope you're all well and safe. Uh, I want to build on, on David's excellent introduction. Um, I want to first of all thank him very much for that introduction and, but above all thank him for creating um, or co-creating the idea of, of these uh, uh, assessment guides uh, which were at the beginning of, of ICAT and which have come a long way so that we are very happy to be able to launch them uh, or their final version of that today through this uh, first webinar in a series. I want to focus on how these assessment guides can help uh, the process of effective policy making and implementation. And just um, to start you off, what I want to take you on is a journey from objectives, from setting global objectives uh, uh, and then turning them into uh, action on the ground. What we are looking at is how transparency uh, can actually help uh, in engaging the many actors that uh, need to be part of that process. So the work that we are launching here today is supporting countries uh, to use a transparency framework, to use structured data and information for the purpose of uh, turning broad global objectives into reality. 
And of course, these, uh, that's part of the mission of ICAT, uh, but these assessment guides uh, play a very central role in making that happen. So who can use these assessment guides? The primary audience of the guides are those in governments that manage policy processes. In all relevant sectors, uh, and also at various levels of governments from the national down to the local level. But the guides can also be useful for other stakeholders that are involved in supporting policy processes. For instance, for financial institutions that want to assess the transformational change potential of certain policies or projects, to NGOs that are supporting subnational policy processes, and we will hear an example of that. Uh, later in, in this webinar, to businesses that want to assess their contribution to certain uh, objectives or to local governments uh, to help uh, improve their own policy processes. So when can these guides be applied? They can be applied uh, before, after or during the policy development process. Before, in order to support effective policy design, during the implementation to track uh, progress, to track, track implementation, and afterwards uh, for monitoring and evaluation. And the assessment guides can support uh, both national and international reporting, which can happen at uh, any stage of the policy process. The guides can be applied throughout the policy design and implementation cycle. Let me uh, go a bit deeper into that. Uh, so starting uh, here at the top uh, with the definition of policy objectives, that's shown in this very light blue. Then secondly, moving uh, to the stage of uh, identifying potential policies and assessing the impacts uh, ex ante. Thirdly, then to help select the most effective policy and initiate implementation. Fourthly, during the implementation, that's when we come to the dark blue here, to track um, effectiveness by assessing the impacts as implementation progresses. And then when we come to the green circle to look at an assessment of results ex post uh, and feed that evaluation back into the next cycle of uh, the policy process to further increase policy effectiveness. On the journey from defining policy objectives to implementation on the ground, several steps can be distinguished. First, setting national targets or broad strategies. This is the level often covered in the NDCs or in general sustainable development or green growth strategies. Just to take an example from the energy sector, a 30% energy efficiency improvement would be such a target. This is not sufficient to allow for the application of the assessment guides. Only a target will not allow a, a detailed assessment that uh, we would like to conduct. So uh, more specifications are needed. And that brings us to the second level, defining the policy instrument. The example here would be for, uh, an energy efficiency standard. Or we can look at the third level, which is uh, specifying measures to be implemented. For instance, measures in terms of technologies or processes um, would be uh, an option. In, in our example, this could uh, include a requirement to replace old inefficient appliances. For these latter two cases where we have a specificity 
in terms of policies, uh, we can actually apply the assessment guidance. Let me uh, link also show how the assessment guides can support uh, reporting. Uh, with reference to the enhanced transparency framework under the, under the Paris Agreement. What you see here is um, the various elements of the enhanced transparency framework as adopted in Katowice. Those elements which can benefit from an application of the ICAT assessment guides are highlighted by a red frame. On the left hand side, in light blue, the, the slide shows four categories of inputs to be prepared. The guides were prepared to support above all countries in assessing progress in implementing the NDCs, which is the second of uh, the uh, elements here uh, on the left. But it can also be used for an assessment of resources needed for NDC implementation, which is the third element, because it then allows uh, to inform reporting on the support that countries need for implementation. This information feeds into the biennial transparency report, which is really at the center of the enhanced transparency framework, one of the three reports that countries uh, are uh, requested to submit as part of the enhanced transparency framework. But ICAT assessment guides can also be used to support uh, through an exposed application the technical review. Um, and then, of course, in uh, applying it uh, in a policy process, as described on my last slide. Um, it can be used to further develop and update NDCs uh, going forward. So reporting is an important element of um, uh, where the assessment guides can help. But let me emphasize that uh, it's critical to use the guides to also support an assessment of policies against national objectives. The ICAT series includes one guide that focuses on sustainable development impacts, and that's why I'm showing here the 17 uh, SDGs. ICAT strongly recommends that countries take a broader perspective beyond reporting and beyond only looking at greenhouse gas impacts. This is especially important when looking at policies that are intended to be transformational, which is another topic that are covered uh, through the uh, series of assessment guides, and you will hear more about that in a, a presentation uh, just uh, later during this webinar. It is important to look beyond uh, greenhouse gases to socioeconomic and environmental indicators to capture national development priorities with data on policy impacts on parameters such as economic growth, job creation, social, environmental, uh, for instance, air and water quality or other such uh, aspects. This will be needed to support effective policy processes uh, by engaging all the relevant uh, stakeholders nationally but it will also help mobilizing investment, whether it's from public or private uh, sources, by showing the investment maturity of policies and by demonstrating to financiers uh, that there's a results-based approach in moving policies into action. Let me just mention in a side note that this latter aspect is especially important uh, right now when uh, countries might be interested in accessing recovery finance packages target at, targeted at stimulating the economy after the current uh, crisis and steering funding then towards a green recovery. 
So let me conclude here and uh, summarize three key aspects that the ICAT series of assessment guides can support. The guides can help users to assess a broad range of impact of policies, which will, first of all, directly improve the effectiveness of policy design and implementation based on good data and information. Secondly, help to engage all relevant stakeholders to integrate across all sectors and at all levels of governance. And last but not least, support accountability by showing results both nationally and through international reporting. So the three keywords that I want to leave you with are effectiveness, integration, and accountability. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Josh and Henning for, uh, and David for outlining that higher level overall purpose and objective of the ICAT assessment guides. Um, as Josh mentioned, uh, I'm going to give a little bit more detail along with my colleagues, Karen and Neelam, um, on what exactly the guides cover and how they can be used. So the series of assessment guides were developed over a period of almost four years um, and included two public consultations as well as an application and piloting phase. Um, and so all of that information fed into each of the different drafts we released of these guides. And throughout those uh, three years or three or four years, we used a few principles to guide our work. And those are listed here. So the first one is enabling. We wanted the guides to be enabling. So we aim to develop user-friendly guidance and the guides do not include rules or requirements. Um, so the, the second one, like I said, is flexible. Uh, the guides need to be flexible. And so they are non-prescriptive in order to accommodate varying national circumstances. The third is leveraging. So we leveraged and built upon existing and emerging work in this space. Um, as David Antonioli mentioned earlier, we um, really looked at WRI's policy and action standard and went deeper in some of the sectors. Um, with that in mind. And then the last one here is the creation of these guides um, being participatory. So we had a broad uh, engagement from a wide range of stakeholders throughout the development process. Um, we had technical working groups for each of the different guides uh, that engaged with us throughout this process. So there are eight impact assessment guides. Um, five of them are focused on greenhouse gas impacts and the other three are focused on sustainable development, transformational change, and non-state and subnational action. So these impact assessment guides are complemented by two process guides. Um, the first one focused on stakeholder participation during impact assessments, and the second on technical review of an impact assessment. And then finally, there's an introduction document, which is very much what we're going through today, um, but it describes each of the guides and how they can be used, as well as giving a short introduction, um, kind of uh, a decision tool for um, how to decide which one you should use. So now I will talk uh, about each of the greenhouse gas guides and Karen and Neelan will also help introduce some of the other guides. So the first of the impact assessment guides is, uh, the GHG impacts, I should say, is renewable energy. So this methodology provides a uh, stepwise approach for assessing the greenhouse gas impacts of renewable energy policies and for estimating the effects of policy design characteristics, financial factors, and other barriers. The focus of this methodology is on policies that target renewable energy deployment. Um, and that includes feed-in tariffs and feed-in premiums, auction and tender policies, and tax incentive policies. As you saw on the assessment overview, uh, assessment guide overview diagram, there's also a buildings efficiency methodology, um, and that's covered in a separate document. However, that guide is only available right now in the draft uh, format and will be finalized in a later stage. The second one I'll introduce for greenhouse gas impacts is transport pricing. The transport pricing methodology provides a stepwise approach for assessing the greenhouse gas impacts of pricing policies specifically in the transport sector. 
um, and, and how to estimate the impacts of higher fuel prices using price elasticities of demand. So the scope of this document includes fuel subsidy removal, increased fuel tax or levies, road pricing, such as road tolls or congestion pricing, and then lastly, vehicle purchase incentives for more efficient vehicles. And then there is the forest methodology, and this provides general principles, concepts, and procedures for estimating greenhouse gas impacts of forest policies that increase carbon sequestration or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the scope on this one includes afforestation or reforestation, sustainable forest management, and avoided deforestation or degradation. Um, similarly, there's also an agriculture methodology, which um, is also in its draft phase and will be finalized in the future. So I'll turn over to Karen now to walk us through sustainable development and transformational change documents. Thanks, Sinclair. Um, so switching to the two documents that were developed jointly by the World Resources Institute and, and UNIDTU partnership, the sustainable development methodology is, like the other documents, a stepwise approach to support integrating the full environmental, social and economic impacts, most relevant to decision making, as also explained by Henning. In a national context, it makes use of the global SDGs, as we now have a global language under the 2030 agenda to speak about and assess all the, the goals for sustainable development and we also have uh, national processes uh, that define priorities and national statistical offices that collect data to report on the SDGs. So ICAT tries to use that what exists and provides this stepwise approach that can help achieve multiple objectives such as tracking and reporting progress on NPCs, promoting integrated national planning, so that uh, as tracking progress of NDCs is not only with a focus on mitigation and emission reductions, but with a full consideration of, of other uh, priorities for development. So the last objective is to integrate climate policy into broader national development policies. And this methodology can, can help provide uh, guidance on how to do that. Next. You also heard of the transformational change methodology. And uh, in this family of, of guides and methods, it's definitely the one starting the most from scratch. We, when we started four, four years ago, there was not much to look at in terms of other methodologies and approaches. So we started with the definition of what is meant. We know that transformational change uh, is, a, is a much used concept among uh, financial institutions, such as the, the Green Climate Fund, the NAMA facility, and also the technology mechanism of the convention. They have a mandate to promote transformational change, but to many it is a new concept. Uh, so we have started to define what it means. Um, and as Henning also explained, it includes the consideration both for greenhouse gas em emission reductions and sustainable development goals. And what it also does is to explain the processes and drivers of such change. It has the same structure, the stepwise approach to assess transformational impacts from policies or actions to drive structural changes in society towards global goals for climate and sustainable development. And here also, by using this, you can achieve multiple objectives, such as assessing the extent of transformation, and this can inform development of effective transformative strategies, particularly ambition raising for NDC implementation, uh, and it can help uh, support transparent and consistent reporting. The next slide. Neelam, I think you might be muted. 
Hi, hopefully you can hear me now. So um, I'll briefly introduce the ICAT non-state and um, subnational actions guide. By non-state and subnational actions, um, we are referring to mitigation actions being taken by non-state and subnational actors, which can include all actors that are not national government. So actions by, say, companies, investors, um, cities, governments, states, and regions. Um, examples include. For, for instance, a company setting a voluntary target to improve its energy efficiency, or a city aiming to reduce its CO2 emissions, um, or a state setting a goal to increase the share of renewable energy. This guide applies to all types of non-state and subnational actions. It provides a forward-looking, comprehensive approach to determine the um, expected or potential future impact of non-state and subnational actions in a country. Um, it also provides steps to support users in assessing how these actions may contribute to national targets and goals or how these may influence a country's emissions trajectory. Often the impact of these actions is not um, fully fully uh, integrated or considered at a national level. And this guide aims to fill this gap and enable greater integration of um, these climate actions in national projections. Uh, the guide enables various kinds of analyses. Uh, some users may just be interested in understanding uh, the landscape of subnational efforts within their jurisdictions. So, for instance, which cities and states are taking action? Um, what share of greenhouse gas emissions do they represent within the country? What kind of targets do they have? Um, this kind of information can help identify opportunities for further engagement with these actors and promote new actions. Um, other users may be interested in going a step further and aggregating the potential impact of these actions. What do these add up to, whether, whether you're interested in economy-wide aggregation or just within a particular sector? Yet others may want to understand the contribution of these actions towards achieving national targets, as I just mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. We are also currently developing a user-friendly Excel-based calculation tool, and there's the screenshot from the tool um, to facilitate the application of the guide. The tool follows the the step-by-step step structure of the guide itself and will support users in um, gathering data systematically, conducting analysis with some inbuilt calculations and conversion metrics, uh, quantifying emissions reductions from actions um, additional to national emission projections, um, and also generate some reports, um, uh, customized reports. We will have a more detailed webinar on this particular guide and the calculation tool on June 3. Uh, please join us then. And also, if you are from the government in one of the ICAT countries and are interested in using this guide, we can support you and please get in touch. Others are also welcome to get in touch. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Thanks, Neelam. So, to round out the series, there are two process guides, um, if you remember from that overview diagram. The first of those is stakeholder participation, and that guide provides practical guidance on how to plan and implement an effective participatory process. Um, and it's supportive of all the other assessment guides and when you're doing one of those assessments. So there's several reasons um, why it's important to include stakeholders in the assessment process, um, but stakeholder participation enhances policies and their assessment um, in at least these three ways here. Um, so it raises awareness, it enables better understanding of, of the policy and how it's being implemented, and it also builds trust and support for those policies. The second of the two process guides is technical review, and David mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, the technical review guide provides guidance for planning and conducting technical review based on three possible approaches, and those are first, second, and third party review. Um, so David talked a lot about an independent third party review, um, but that's sort of the, the end of the, the line of 
sort of level of rigor or um, detail and level of independence. There are a couple other approaches you could use when you use this document to help you um, improve your assessment over time. So uh, a couple reasons or uh, benefits of technical review is that it supports learning and improvement of assessments over time, and it enhances the transparency and reporting of impacts. So now that you've heard a little bit of an introduction on each of these assessment guides, and of course they'll be discussed in more detail throughout the webinar series, um, Karen is gonna speak about how to determine which guide you should use and the different ways that you can use them. And this will be the last two slides uh, that, that introduce all the guides. Uh, this tells you uh, from the introductory guide uh, which assessment guide should you use among all the ones now introduced. Uh, so if you are new to, to this toolbox um, and don't know any of them, uh, a good starting point is this very brief introductory guide. That's the green boxes here, which gives you this overview of what all the methodologies um, are and can help you do. And if you then feel that you know enough to, to, to pick which ones would you use, um, this can be decided based on the types of impacts that you want to assess among the, the five options for the greenhouse gas um, methodologies and then uh, for each of the sustainable development and transformational change methodologies that are not sector specific uh, but but are applicable to all types of policies and actions um, they are designed so that they can be used together particularly the the stakeholder um, engagement guide we have direct references in all the documents uh, when and how you can involve stakeholders to enhance the quality and credibility of the assessment. Um, and you have then in the blue boxes, uh, you have a lot more detailed on the, uh, the, the generic structure of, of, uh, of all the assessment guides, including a planning session so that you can you can be briefly introduced to what it takes to use these guides in terms of what skills are needed, how much time does it take to to use it, what other resources uh, do you need to to do an assessment. Um, next slide. This is the last one on key recommendations, and uh, this also explains the architecture of uh, all the the guides. Um, key recommendations are steps or elements for users to follow for uh, assessing and reporting impacts of policies and actions. And there are two options of how to use these key recommendations. One is the flexible approach and the other one is the key recommendation approach where you follow all the recommendations. So in the flexible approach, you don't necessarily follow all the recommended steps. Uh, this is likely to make your assessment more uncertain and be more useful for an internal audience. Whereas if you follow all steps, uh, and you could even apply the, the technical review for, for if you go for the highest, the third party independent assessment, you would have the most credible impact assessment for an external audience. But we know that the, the objectives of using these guides are going to vary a whole lot depending on the users. So there are these two options um, of using the guides. Okay, greetings everybody from the Grupo Ecologico Sierra Gorda in Mexico. The Grupo Ecologico Sierra Gorda is coordinating a nationally appropriate mitigation action, NAMA, of subnational mitigation actions for the regeneration of landscapes. Here is some basic information about this NAMA. Uh, it involves, uh, there were pilot activities in six states beginning in the year 2015, and we're projecting to continue this NAMA through at least the year 2030 with the participation of 12 states. 
uh, initial projection of lands involved include uh, uh, 1 million hectares of agricultural lands, both grazing lands and, uh, and crop lands, and uh, 240,000 hectares of forest. That's being coordinated by the Grupo Ecologico Sierra Gorda, which is a non-governmental organization in collaboration with the government of the state of Querétaro, which is the founding state of this NAMA, and which is inviting the participation of other states. This NAMA involves the, the following uh, basic components. Number one is state funding mechanisms in which the participating states establish uh, special cl climate change or environmental funds to, with dedicated funding sources to finance regeneration of forests and agricultural lands. And then each state uh, chooses at least two, uh, uh, two subnational actions, uh, choosing among the regeneration of forests, the regeneration of grazing lands, and the regeneration of crop lands. Another component is the orientation of public policies and programs, uh, both at the state level and at the federal level, as well as awareness campaigns that will be implemented in the major cities of the participating states to uh, cultivate uh, support among the general public for these activities. Okay. We, these are the guidance documents of ECOT that we apply. First of all was the introductory guide. And as was mentioned, this was very useful for us to give us a broad overview of all the different guides and to help us decide which of the guides to apply. And we decided to apply uh, the following five guides. First, the agricultural uh, guidance guide to estimate the greenhouse gas impacts of subnational actions for the regeneration of uh, agricultural lands. Then the forest guidance to estimate the greenhouse, greenhouse gas impacts of subnational actions to regenerate forest. And then a transformational change guidance, uh, which also incorporates the concepts uh, not only of greenhouse gas impacts, but also sustainable development impacts. And we decided to implement this because uh, we are seeking uh, funding from international uh, funding sources that give high priority to transformational change. And, uh, and this is also important at a national level. And then we also implemented the non-state and sub-national action guidance in order to compare the greenhouse gas impacts of these state actions with the sectorial goals uh, for the forestry and agricultural sectors uh, under the nationally, uh, nationally determined contributions of Mexico. And then finally, we implemented the technical review guidance to have an external uh, technical review of of the reports that we prepared. We decided to use the key recommendations approach, so we implemented all of the key recommendations of these guidance documents, and we also decided to implement both, both an ex post evaluation of the pilot project activities that were implemented, as well as an ex ante evaluation projecting impacts into the future. Here in this slide are examples of some of the results. So from implementing the agricultural guidance document, we came up with an estimation of a net greenhouse gas impact of 2.9 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in the year 2030. We chose year 2030 because that is the goal year for Mexico's NDC. And then by applying the subnational uh, action guidance document, it, we compared that to the sectorial goal under the Mexico's NDC, and it represents 41% of that goal. So that's very significant. Um, then also through using the transformational uh, change 
guidance document. Uh, we estimated various uh, indi indicators of uh, sustainable development. And we came up with an estimate of a 53% increase in the income of participating ranches that implement regenerative management of their ranches. And this was based on some pilot project activities, so some real data. And then also another indicator was to estimate uh, both the economic and the environmental returns in the four forest sector. And uh, it was estimated at 408 million pesos per year. Okay, so all that information was, was very useful, and then we uh, conducted a technical review. So we did a request for proposals and received uh, numerous very, very good proposals, and we decided to go with Echo Agricultural Partners, which is an international organization based in the, in the United States with expertise in landscape uh, management and quantification of uh, greenhouse gas impacts. So they conducted a desk review of the assessment report. So they actually reviewed the reports, key recommendation by key recommendation and calculation by calculation to ensure that they were complete and, and accurate and conservative. And then they also uh, came to Mexico for a site visit and meetings with implementing partners. They had meetings, uh, on the photo on the left there, with representatives from the state ministries that were involved, including the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Agriculture, the National Forestry Commission, and others. In the photo in the center there, they also had a, a meeting with the Secretary of Sustainable Development of the state of Carretero, the founding state of this NEMA. And then on the right, they also had meetings with landowners. Uh, people who own, own the forests and own these agricultural lands who are implementing these regenerative practices. So, where I want to emphasize in this presentation are the benefits of the assessment. Uh, one is it showed that the NAMA can significantly contribute to Mexico's NDC goals for the involved sectors. And this is very important to us because this has allowed us to, to solidify and obtain more support from the uh, federal ministries involved because now they see uh, solid numbers about the potential for this to, to help achieve those national goals. It also showed that the regeneration of forests and agricultural lands can contribute to state climate change goals as well as state sustainable development goals. So this has been very useful to help us uh, solidify the participation of those states that had early actions and to recruit more states to participate in the NAMA. And it's also, uh, so this has helped uh, us in our invitation of new project partners at all levels. And also it is helping us in our fundraising efforts at international levels. We use results of the reports to report to the donor that financed the pilot project activities. And we are using results from these reports in, uh, in proposals that we are preparing for international donors to try to get more financing for these activities. Also, these reports have provided data that the states have been using in national and international fora. During the summer, there was a, a big event with the Under Two Coalition, and uh, a couple of the states used uh, results from these reports in their presentations during that event. And it has also provided capacity building for ongoing monitoring and quantification of the impacts of the NAP. And also I would say that it also had additional benefits of, of helping us to actually improve the design of the NAMA. Uh, the, the emphasis on integrated landscapes came out of the, uh, the external review process. And there were several other design improvements as well. So our experience was very positive it, it met our goals to provide the key information that we needed. Uh, it's helped us recruit more partners. It's helping us to obtain more funding and uh, it strengthened the design of them. 
So with that, I'll conclude so that we move on to the question session. How do the ICAT assessment guides complement previous or existing approaches? Um, how does this dif uh, differ from UNF C methodology? Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, thanks to the, uh, all the presenters uh, for excellent presentations and to the audience for uh, staying with us and, and some very interesting questions. Um, so um, the assessment guides really build on uh, uh, existing uh, and other approaches. Uh, in, in some cases, um, we've really taken work uh, from, for instance, the World Resource Institute as a starting point for developing the guides, and they are all uh, clearly referenced in, in, in the various guides. Um, we've not gone into certain topics uh, like the waste sector, where we have been uh, informed that other um, methodologies already exist. Uh, in terms of uh, reference to the UNFCC methodologies, uh, I mean, those are really uh, reporting guidances, uh, so uh, they do cover different ground. Of course, what is most relevant in terms of methodologies that comes through the UNFCC process are the uh, emission inventory um, guidances, um, and they are really focused on emission inventories, whereas uh, the ICAT assessment guides focus on, on policy assessment, so they are different. Um, the UNFCC secretariat uh, has been and continues to be uh, part of uh, the uh, steering committee of ICAT and has been and continues to be part of the advisory committee of ICAT that uh, uh, screens and, and advises us on, on all the work we do. So uh, they have uh, continuously supported uh, the development of, of these guides uh, to make sure that they are complementary and we are continuing to, to work with them to also ensure an effective uh, rollout of, of uh, these guides. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Henning, and also the questioner for that. Um, your second half of the question, uh, we'll loop back to uh, in a moment. Um, we have another question uh, coming in from uh, for David Ross. Uh, so on the ground question is, uh, what resources does an organization need to apply the assessment guides? The resources needed will depend upon the sector of the policy or action, uh, as well as the specific design. In our case, it required uh, someone, uh, me, uh, who led the process and uh, helped, uh, and I was the pr primary author of the reports, but it was truly a team effort. We also needed to involve the leaders of the projects themselves, the people who actually lead the implementation of these regenerative activities on the ground, uh, as well as uh, pol policy makers who can really play a key role in determining the, uh, the extent of the, to, to determine the, both the potential and likely implementation potential of the actions. And in this case, in case of regenerative activities, uh, that means how many hectares of land are going to have improve management activities. So, you, so you, it does require a, a team effort with people with knowledge of these different areas. The methods are flexible in that you can use uh, default uh, factors from IPCC or you can do local studies. We did a combination using some default factors and but we also had a local study in the forest regeneration areas to estimate the uh, the greenhouse gas impacts per hectare. Okay, thank you, David. Um, if you have follow-up questions, uh, we're live on the the question feed, so uh, please uh, post them into there as well. Um, we've got a 
uh, another one that's uh, for Neela, um, and it's uh, getting quite specific, is the NS uh, non-state uh, action calculation tool integrated uh, with the ICLA global GHG protocol for credible emissions calculation and CDP. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so um, it it so it's the the calculation tool won't be integrated with a specific external calculation tool. But but having said that, it does allow users to bring it to to input already calculated emissions or already calculated um, impact values and input them directly into into the the tool so um, if you or, or import um, an already existing database of climate action so if all that information is existing somewhere else and you don't want to input it one by one into the tool it allows you to import all that information so um, in that way it is it's compatible with just um, um, including information from external tools um, uh, um, directly into this particular tool without having to input raw data and calculating and going through um, each and every calculation okay thank you Neelam um, for the, the next question, I'm going to loop back to you, Neelam, uh, in a, a sub uh, part of a, a question, but uh, it's going to, to Henning, um, and it's looking about the, the position um, or you know, existence of adaptation in the guides, in the ICAT series of assessment guides. And as a sub question to come back to you, Neelam, is does uh, the non state um, uh, ACTOF uh, guide focus solely on mitigation actions and what about adaptation actions? But I'll start with Henning there. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. No, that's a very important question. And um, um, we have, of course, covered some of the adaptation relevant information um, through the sustainable development methodology. Uh, since uh, some of those parameters are uh, relevant for adaptation, but we do not have a guide that specifically focuses on adaptation. Uh, it's part of ICAT's mandate, and uh, when we started off the work, we uh, clearly wanted to move into that direction, but it was also clear that the basis for uh, developing such a guide is much um, more uh, much less um, solid than uh, in looking uh, at mitigation. So what we have done is we've done an assessment of uh, the available um, methodologies of available indicators and so on. And we then decided that we would develop uh, methodologies um, separately, uh, bottom up. Uh, we've started a, a, a separate uh, process focused on adaptation working with five countries um, india south africa uh, the dominican republic kenya and bangladesh having very different realities in order to in, in a bottom-up fashion develop uh, uh, methodologies that can be applied what we realized after the first year of this uh, project was that uh, adaptation needs to be assessed um, at the local level in, in, in most cases. So often um, the kind of indicators are very different within a country, even a small country like uh, Bangladesh, depending on what, what you're looking at. And so what we are developing is much more a process methodology now um, that can uh, link uh, from the national level to the subnational level in, in the sense that that's also a nice intro then for for Neelam uh, to to refer to that uh, uh, contribution from that guide thank you yeah, so um, the non-state guide, unfortunately, does not focus on adaptation actions. It is very much um, limited to mitigation actions and um, largely because of the um, one, the available databases at the international level, um, when you look at climate actions, they are uh, they tend to be very mitigation focused, and it also becomes very complex to 
convert adaptation oriented actions into um, GAG metrics. So um, it doesn't focus on uh, adaptation actions. Thank you, Henning and Nilam. Uh, we have another um, really interesting one, uh, which is for Karen, um, and our participant uh, is asking, what is one example of transformational change in climate policy? Yes. Um... We have uh, a number of uh, pilot studies done, and you heard from uh, uh, from David that uh, there was an assessment of uh, transformational change also in in the Sierra Gorda case, which I understand informed how to improve the design. Um, uh, if we are to go for real world examples um, of where we see transformational change. It depends on the, um, you could say, the, the scale of the system that you want to transform. If you would like to know more in depth on one example of transformational change, I would recommend that you uh, attend the next webinar that goes into depth on the sustainable development and transformational change uh, methodologies, where we will have an example from Costa Rica that have applied both methodologies at a national scale. It's too early to say that they have achieved targets because uh, typically the, the goals for transformation, uh, which we have defined as uh, zero carbon in line with the IPCC special report of what it takes to stay below 1.5 degrees of temperature increase. Um, it is something that, that uh, takes time. I think it was 2050, which is the goal for zero carbon in Costa Rica. Uh, but, but at a national scale, I think this is a good example of where at least the vision and ambition is there to achieve such transformation. Um, at other levels, smaller systems, because we define it as relative to the system, it could also be a sector. Let's say for, for, for transport, we define transformational change to a full transition to electric vehicles, zero carbon pump. This is very difficult. I don't think we have achieved that anywhere. But you will see that in, in context of what we call the phase model, which shows the various various sort of uh, historical phases that, that a system would go through, that um, in most developing countries, we find that, that um, countries are still in a in a early uh, early phase either take off or uh, no development yet and and in some sectors in some countries uh, for instance in Denmark where i come from you can see examples from the energy sector where we have a, a policy which says 100% renewable for the energy sector which will then also help transform power to other sectors will also help transform other sectors. Uh, but you will also find examples uh, from the pilot case studies uh, in, in this final assessment. This was the new thing in this final version that we have examples uh, of, of transformation. Thanks, Karen. Um, while, you're, while you're here, there's a question uh, for both uh, Henning and yourself. Um, and it's uh, looking at the, the applications and looking at uh, any businesses uh, that are using the guides. Yes. Oh. Go ahead, Karen. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. No, I just want to say that we have on the, the transformational change uh, methodology we we have started to apply this in the, in a number of contexts. Uh, uh, one is with for portfolio assessments of investments, so that it is as you also heard Henning say earlier that it is very much finance institutions that want to demonstrate alignment with global goals, particularly Paris Agreement goals. 
that have started to assess uh, investments for their greenhouse gas impact, but also for wider society impacts for transformation. Um, and in the context of uh, companies, businesses using it, it's, it's a little early, but we are applying this methodology in context of carbon markets, which is very much for private sector engagement towards MTC implementation. We don't have results yet, but in another year, it, it takes these things take time. But in another year, I think we would we would be able to come up with more concrete examples of of, of how this concept is also relevant to, to businesses. Okay. Thank you, Karen. So we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to ask our uh, wonderful speakers. Um, I know it's uh, tough and you want to keep talking about uh, these topics to try and uh, you know, keep your, your answers brief so we can get, as, uh, get through as many questions as possible. Um, we have another question for David Antonioli, um, and it's a very topical one, uh, which is, uh, looking at the yeah taking into account the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic and economic crisis um, you know how are the how are the assessment guides you know kind of accommodating or, or adapting to or considering uh, the current state of global affairs um, thank you Josh again thanks everybody for the great webinar um, that's a good question you know I, I guess I, I would pass that on to Henning to decide or to talk about whether the, you know, anything's being done in respect of COVID in particular. But I think it's important to take into account that, you know, this is a toolbox. And as such, it's designed to help you assess any policy um, that would address climate change. So it's not, it, I don't think it really relates directly to which policies uh, are being implemented yesterday versus a year ago. It's just a matter of providing a toolbox that enables governments and others to credibly assess the outcome of their policies. So I, I think that, uh, you know, there may be some interesting and innovative policies coming out of the COVID pandemic. For example, I've heard a lot of discussions that governments are saying, well, maybe if we're going to be, you know, really funneling a lot of money to keep the economy going, maybe this is a time to really redirect a lot of that to sustainable development, renewable energy, you know, other climate friendly policies. Those would be a very useful uh, you know, thing to look at in the context of the ICAP policies. Uh, but I don't know if anybody else has anything else to say to that. Thanks. Yeah, let me, thanks, David. Now, this is exactly the direction. Uh, we have done an assessment uh, of um, how countries can continue or not the work that we are doing with them uh, as ICAP and uh, the feedback from uh, those countries that have been applying um, the sustainable development methodology has been that actually the data that they have uh, uh, produced using that methodology has been extremely useful now to inform how to uh, support uh, recovery after the crisis. So if you have data on how policies can actually impact uh, job creation or economic growth, then you, you have a good basis uh, to have targeted uh, spending of, of recovery funding that uh, multilateral development banks are currently offering to some of the uh, developing countries. So that's one example where it has been useful. But in general, I would say, I mean, evidence-based policy making is becoming especially important when you have such crunch situations and need crisis management where you have to uh, of that different objectives and need the kind of assessment and data ability to do that. Thank you. Thank you, David and Henning. Um, Sorry, let me, can I just add one thing? I think it's worth pointing out that um, the toolbox can also be used to assess impacts of policies ex ante. So it's not just a matter of looking at past policies, but also looking at, you know, you can use the toolbox to look at what the likely impact of a policy would be. So in this context, this could be very powerful. Okay. If you have further questions, we've got a few more uh, minutes for them. Um, the next one comes uh, for David Ross. Um, 
Uh, our question is asking what was the cost implication uh, on Mexico and NAMA and uh, what types of uh, crops have been regenerated through the NAMA? I'm sorry, could you please repeat that question? Sure. Is, uh, what was the cost implication on uh, the Mexican NAMA and what type of crops have been regenerated through it? Okay, the, the cost implication of the... So a couple ways of understanding that question. One would be what are the costs of implementing the, the regenerative actions? And that varies greatly depending upon the, the, the sector uh, and uh, the landowner. For example, uh, in areas of, of, of extreme poverty in the Sierra Gorda Biosphere Reserve um, for the regeneration of forests, they're paying uh, 600 uh, pesos per hectare to the landowner. And under the economic conditions there, that is uh, sufficient and welcomed by the landowners in exchange for removing cattle, grazing, and other degradation factors. Uh, it, on ranches, it really depends on the size of the ranch, how much uh, the costs are. And uh, what was the second part of the question again, Josh? Yep, it's uh, what type of crops have been regenerated? Okay, actually the, the NAMA in the, uh, the pilot project activities didn't include crops. It included the regeneration of forests and grazing lands. But at the request of the, the Ministry of Agriculture, we have now uh, added to the NAMA a new component that is going to focus on crops of, of corn and wheat, basic grains. And that's, that's going to be the, the focus of the the regeneration of crop component of the NAMA. Okay, thank you so much, David. Um, we've got time for a couple more. Um, the next one is for Henning, um, and it's our questioner is asking, uh, would the ICAC guidances be useful to be applied for national communication reports and which guidances? And uh, second uh, part is, which guide would you use if you were to restore or assess wetlands? Thank you. No, I, the, the wetlands question I'll pass over to Sinclair because I think she might be better placed to, to respond to that. Um, um, on the national communications guide, um, I, I think it's more for uh, biannual update reports that the guides can be, be used. Uh, um, I mean, the guides are supporting policy MRV and, and that has come in um, through the biannual update reports, but of course, must, much more it will come uh, through the biannual transparency reports. Um, so it's policy MRV that, that is really the target of, of uh, the guides and uh, they have come in further down the line in, after the national communications. And the wetlands over to, to Sinclair, if she can uh, pick that up. Yeah. So as far as the wetlands go, that could fall under the scope of the forest methodology if those activities are you know, focused around reforestation or preventing deforestation. Um, but it, it would be necessary to kind of think through the details of the specific activities that you're implementing. So I'd encourage you to um, join the forest webinar, which is in June. Okay, and it seems that uh, a lot of our um, webinar participants do want to get down to the, the details, so uh, I would highly recommend to join the, the other webinars coming up, which I'll uh, give a plug for, because uh, the next question is looking at, um, again for you, uh, David Ross, um, in Mexico um, about the aggregation of data. So what data did you use to get to the results? Um, and the second part of the question is, uh, do the guides include indigenous perspectives in the methodologies? Uh, so in terms of the aggregated data, well, uh, since we are, we have six states that participated in pilot project activities or early action activities, and then we're projecting the participation of six additional states going forward. So we estimated 
the greenhouse gas impacts of the subnational actions for all 12 of those states, and then aggregated that, and then compared that to the sectoral goals uh, that correspond to Mexico's NDCs. I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, yep, is uh, were indigenous peoples uh, included in uh, the assessment methodologies? There in the assessment methodologies, they can be included under the sustainable development uh, aspects. So, uh, so we didn't apply the sustainable development guidance document, but we did apply the transformational change guidance document, which includes the concepts of climate change mitigation and sustainable development. So there are opportunities um, under sustainable development uh, criteria to take that into account. As, as we go forward, the recommendation of the state agricultural ministry to include uh, agricultural lands is very uh, tightly linked to their giving high priority to providing support for basic food items like basic grains that are grown in the most porous areas, which are often areas that have indigenous communities. So it will be an important aspect of our NAMA going forward. Okay, so I regret to say that that is uh, all the time we have for question and answers. Um, and on that note, uh, I think I'd, I'd really uh, like to give a, a round of applause, a, a virtual round of applause to uh, not only our speakers for, for presenting and answering all those questions, but uh, again, for everybody who's joined the webinar and is uh, providing all these uh, thoughtful questions. Um, I hope they were. Um, yeah, very useful uh, to support you going forward in terms of uh, utilizing these uh, assessment guides. Um, I leave up this uh, one slide for you just to so that we can uh, walk away with uh, the real kind of the crux of what these uh, assessment guides are trying to uh, support uh, all of the all of you online uh, in terms of uh, technical experts and uh, and country actors um, and. To highlight that uh, this is the first webinar, or part of a webinar series. Um, there's five more to come. Um, the next webinar will be on sustainable development and transformational change, which as you can see is coming up on the uh, 20, 20th of May. Um, please go to climateactiontransparency.org to register for these uh, webinars. Uh, you can register for all five of them. Um, and yeah, they are going to be, uh, as, as we kind of touched on, they are going to be diving uh, deeper into the case applications for it. So um, a lot more of what we heard from, from David, uh, real life applications uh, of these assessment guides. Um, I'd like to say thank you once more. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, email us at icat at unops.org. Um, and follow us on ICAT Climate uh, on Twitter um, and visit the website if you, and, uh, and there's a, a newsletter sign in box to you know, keep up to date with, uh, with everything that's happening with ICAT, with, whether it's webinars, uh, whether it's uh, other, other uh, latest news. Um, so I wish you a, a very creative and productive rest of the morning or afternoon, wherever you are. And I hope to see you all online uh, two weeks from now uh, in the next webinar. So thank you to our speakers, thank you to our participants, and good afternoon.